tell you that there's one person here who's going to enjoy this more than anyone. <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Crockett has done so much to make this a uh, success, and I have to thank him. And particularly... <laughs> I particularly have to thank him. He, he told me he'd let me finish this time. <laughs> if, I, if I fail to do that, I'll, I'm available for questions immediately after, for as long as you like. And uh, I usually go to the garden after the service every Sunday and have a cup of coffee. So don't be shy. Don't be afraid to come and ask any questions. I can, Field, I'd be delighted to do that. Um, please, everyone, notice my DNA necktie. <laughs> I have two of those. And, uh, that will remind me of, uh, keep my mind on track because DNA is going to be central to every, everything I say, whether I'm saying the words DNA or not. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, these books that Jeff, in addition to everything else he's provided, the chairs, the food, uh, he has ordered uh, the five books on the reading list, and they're on the bookmobile, and uh, the five of them are here. Last time I, I, I had uh, the title, sort of a grandiose title, The Human Story in the Language of DNA. Today I'm, I'm going to break that down into three subtitles, genealogy, genetics, and genomics, three sections. And genealogy is my hobby. Uh, genetics is my profession. And genomics is the future of everything. So we all know, let's start with genealogy. You all, because that's a simple starting point and everybody knows about doing your family tree. Um, I want to give you a quote from Jennifer Boylan, a professor at Barnard College. Uh, just in February, she said this, and I quote, what question is it we're trying to answer when we set off in search of our ancestors? Clearly, it has something to do with connection, with the wistful hope that learning about where we came from will help us understand who we are. I could just say, uh, I, I tend to a family tree of 17,000 persons, all identified by dates and places of births and deaths. I'm still trying to figure out who I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I attend Bible study with Pastor Al trying to figure things out. I, I don't see Al here today. I think he I was here last time. So. so two first messages from genealogy are mathematical. We are unique. Every one of us is a snowflake. Since the beginning of time, uh, astronomers have uh, calculated that 10 to the 45th power snowflakes have fallen to earth and no two of them are alike. Uh, Wilson Bentley spent his lifetime photographing snowflakes and did thousands and thousands and there are no two alike. So, 
call my students snowflakes. We are all snowflakes. Um, Seven billion persons are alive in the world today of 107 billion that have existed since the beginning of Homo sapiens. And no two are alike. And someone always says, well, what about identical twins? Uh, identical twins are not identical. <laughs> Close, but not identical. So I quote from Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is your than you. <laughs> and we'll get near the end. Perhaps I'll be able to talk about precision medicine, but that's based on our singularity, our individuality. And that uniqueness is beautiful to me, and it has a spiritual quality that each one of us is absolutely unique. Every one of us, forever, in all of history and all of the future, there will never be another one exactly like you. Secondly, so that's mathematics. Secondly, we are all related. Every person in this room is related much more closely than you think to every other person in this room. We may not be actual siblings, but we're at least distant cousins. Regardless of the way we look or what color we are, we're all related. Why is that and how can you understand that? Simple. You have a mother and a father, two parents. You have four grandparents. You have eight great grandparents. You have 16 great great grandparents. And as you keep going back, your pedigree, your family tree takes on a diamond shape. First, there are more and more and more and more ancestors who fed into you. And then there are fewer and fewer and fewer. And you reach a point when the number of your mathematical ancestors is greater than the total number of persons alive when, they, when your earliest ancestor was there. So we have to share and we do share our ancestors. And if we, if we had knowledge of who all of them were, uh, we could delineate our relationships. One single person who lived 3,400 years ago, really not too long ago, 3,400 years. <clears throat> One person at that time is the ancestor of every person here. Now, each of us had other ancestors at that time. But that one person 3,400 years ago was an ancestor of each one of us. Some of you may have done your genealogy and you can proudly say, I'm a, I'm a descendant of Charlemagne. <laughs> well, it turns out all of us are descendants of Charlemagne. <laughs> and again, it's, it's mathematics. He was born in 742. That was 14 centuries or roughly 56 generations ago. At that time, there were 137,453,472 mathematical ancestors of each one of us. 
Not enough to go around. <laughs> so Charlemagne had 18 children alone. And any person in all of history who was a parent is an ancestor of you, of any one of you, and all of us. It's amazing how related we are. And our relatedness uh, is something beautiful and spiritual. We're all different, but we're all connected. Now, there are types of relationships that you need to think about. Uh, first of all, we think right away, well, I'm a direct descendant of so-and-so, George Washington, let's say. So I, he's my great-great-great-grandfather, and then his son and his daughter and his son and his daughter comes down directly. So you can be a direct descendant of someone. Or you could be a cousin of someone who's also a direct descendant of that ancestor, but you came down in separate lines, first of all it would be siblings, but after that would be cousins. Cousins more and more and more and more distant from each other, but cousins. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, for in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. So who are we? And I direct you to the book Sapiens. Many of you have read this and raved about it. Uh, I noticed last week in the New York Times, it was number one on the New York Times paperback bestseller list and had been there for 41 weeks. It's been translated into 28 languages and has been a bestseller all over the world. And by the way, Jeff has copies on the bookmobile of all of these uh, books that I'll be talking about. Uh, the book addresses uh, the weirdness of our being the only species of the genus Homo. Think about dogs, foxes, coyotes, wolves. Those are different species of the same genus. But there's only one Homo sapiens. There used to be Homo neanderthalensis. They lasted about 40,000 years but disappeared about 30,000 years ago. So that was another homo species. Uh, there are the Denisovans, homo Denisovan, but they've disappeared. So there's this weird phenomenon. Uh, why only one homo, homo sapiens, us? What are we? Who are we? We are distinguished, by the way, biologically, by an innate moral sense. And I'm not talking religion here, I'm talking biology. This is a characteristic of Homo sapiens. And by our, what has been called by uh, Professor Wilson at Harvard, famous, famous biologist. We're distinguished by eusociality. It's a word that he introduced. And that's the practice of cooperatively rearing our young across multiple generations. 
of all the species of animals that have lived, I believe it's 300,000 since the beginning of time, only 20 actually care for their young as grandparents and further. And we are one of those 20 species. The others are ants and termites. <laughs> Just this week, I read of Yale University professor Nicholas Christakis listed, he's listed by, was listed by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He's just written a new book that we don't have, it's not on the bookmobile because it just came out this week. It's called Blueprint. And in that book, he argues that we are genetically wired and naturally selected. Those are key words. Darwinian natural selection. We are selected for our transcendent goodness. What is our goodness? Our friendships, our cooperation, our teaching, and our love, his thesis is that those things outweigh our tribalism, violence, selfishness, and brutality. So far. <clears throat> There's an innate goodness in homo sapiens. Reassuring to hear. <laughs> So that brings me to, that's the end of uh, genealogy. Now I'm gonna talk about genetics, which is what I do. So I'm just gonna put in some tidbits of uh, my history. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been a member of this church for 50 years. Uh, one time I was a deacon. Uh, I, I used to sing in the choir before I came, uh, became permanently hoarse. And uh, my wife, Annie, sitting here in the green dress, has much greater credentials than I do. She was the treasurer of this church for three years. And uh, anyone who can endure that office is, uh, needs uh, recognition. I've been a member of the full-time faculty at the University of Miami School of Medicine for 54 years. My specialty is genetic medicine. And uh, my, my official title is professor of medicine. In that, over that time, I've had the privilege of uh, shepherding and watching <coughs> Uh, to the point of graduation, graduate MDs, uh, about 7,500 doctors. So when I get sick, I know where to go. Uh, quickly, I'm, I'm 84 years old. I was born in St. Louis. I grew up through high school in Evanston, Illinois. My father was a lawyer for the federal government. I have uh, five children and 10 grandchildren <coughs> with uh, number 11 due today. <laughs> <laughs> that will occur in Berkeley, California. Uh, my, my late brother was a doctor, an anesthesiologist. My, my son is a family doctor in Berkeley, California. I'm a graduate of Princeton, uh, as Jeff mentioned, where I majored in organic chemistry. When I, when I say Princeton, I'm reminded of Albert Einstein because at one magic moment there I was 
attending a lecture and he came in and sat right in front of me. Wow. That, was, that was a thrill that I haven't forgotten. So it brings me to my, one of my favorite quotes by him. You don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. <laughs> to leave today without understanding what I've said. <laughs> well, I, a, I was a graduate. Uh, my MD is from Washington University in St. Louis. And my students today, I'm, I st I'm still working. I teach. And uh, my students sometimes Inevitably, they say, Dr. Mensch, how did you ever start in genetics? That's weird. <laughs> how did you get interested in genetics? And I, so I have to tell them this story. I was a second year student taking the required course in microbiology in 1957. You may recall that Watson and Crick had described the structure of DNA in 1953. So we knew that DNA was a double helix, as shown on my necktie. And we had known for decades that DNA contained genetic information. In fact, it was the genetic information, this molecule, DNA. So we knew its structure and we knew what it did, but we didn't know how it reproduced itself, how it replicated itself. How is DNA synthesized as it has to be? And the amount that we have in every cell uh, is, is phenomenal. Um, so my professor then, and I, I'm, I'm just telling this story in homage to Arthur Kornberg, was not only a brilliant scientist, but a great human being and teacher. And he was working on the problem. How is synthesized, how is DNA synthesized? Nobody knew. No one had ever done it. But he did it in the laboratory. And he thought, oh, I've done it. Now I'm going to have all the medical students in the second year class do it. <laughs> and so he wrote a protocol, a cookbook, like Moira was talking about. And all of us in the laboratory went through the steps sort of mechanically with thoughtlessly synthesizing DNA. But when I saw the result, it struck me. It was an epiphany. I thought, my god, I've just synthesized DNA? I, sent, I, I can't believe this. This is the future of all of medicine. So that's, that's what got me started. And I followed him uh, to Stanford University for postdoctoral studies where I met and interacted with Watson and Crick and uh, Gobind Karana, who got the Nobel Prize for figuring out the genetic code. Uh, so to all these great figures, I, I, I just uh, I pay homage. I, I can't say enough. But that's how I, that's how I got started. Just uh, a year ago, Ani and I went to a reunion at Stanford. And at the final brunch breakfast, there were six 
Nobel laureates in medicine, all of whom had been students of Arthur Kornberg. And they weren't his only no Nobel laureates, they were just the ones who were able to attend the reunion. How, how, how can such brilliance exist? And one of them was his son. His son went on to get a Nobel Prize in medicine. Roger. Roger was a high school student when I was there. He used to work in my lab. Now I see patients with genetic disorders or people who have a family member with a genetic disorder. There are more than 7,000 genetic disorders described so far. Cancer is one of the, all the forms of cancers are strong in that group. So what is DNA? Our defining hereditary blueprint that's in our chromosomes. DNA is a linear, sequential, informational macromolecule. <coughs> After I say that, you're probably thinking, what the hell is that? <laughs> and I can make it very easy for you. The English language is a linear, sequential arrangement of informational 26 letters. Everything we've said and heard today can be written as a sequence of letters, an informational sequence. Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Hamlet is nothing more or less than a sequence of 26 letters. Macbeth is a different sequence of 26 letters. So DNA, like English or Spanish or any other language, alphabetical language, is a sequence of letters, but in DNA there are just four letters, A, G, C, and T, not 26. Francis Collins wrote this wonderful book, it's on the book reveal. Uh, he wrote it in 2005. Francis Collins is the currently the director of the National Institutes of Health. He's an internationally famous scientist and geneticist. The book is autobiographical and shows how he went uh, from being a child with no religious instruction to an adult atheist but by nature of his science and studying DNA, he became a committed Christian. Not, not the usual path that you read about. <laughs> when I mentioned Francis Collins to my wife, she said, you mean that guy playing the guitar at the party? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy, he's a great guitar player. Bodies uh, consist of about 13 billion cells, uh, and our DNA uh, in every one of those cells consists of about 3 billion letters that we get from mom and 3 billion from dad, 6 billion letters would fill a library of ordinary books. And if we read those at a rate of three per second, it would take 62 years. So when you think about compaction of information, DNA is the, the ultimate example. 
Now, uh, back to our identity. Um, our individual genomes consist of sequences of about 999 letters that are identical in all of us, on average. And then the thousandth letter is different. I might be a G, you might be a T. And then we go for another thousand letters, identical. So I am identical to any person in this room, regardless of your sex or color or background, anything, for 999 out of every thousand letters in our DNA. When you think about that, you think, gee, that doesn't make sense because we don't look like each other. We don't seem that similar to be 99.9% .9 the same. Doesn't make sense. But remember, we have six billion letters. So if we're identical in 999 out of 1,000 of those, then we're different in six million ways. <laughs> so now, the difference between me and any one of you is six million letters. Now, almost all of those differences are benign. They account for things like uh, uh, skin color, hair color, eye color, just benign characteristics of our what are called our phenotype, how we look and how our bodies function, different phenotypes. But occasionally, that different letter is not benign. It, it is a mutation. It's a mutation by definition if it's bad and causes a disease, and it's rare. And the, cla the classic example, for example, would be sickle cell disease, which is a type of anemia, which is a serious illness. It's caused by the change of one letter, one typographical mistake that has to come, in this case, it's recessive, so it has, the affected person has to receive that mistake, that mutation, from both mom and dad. But one letter can be devastating. One typographical error. We call that a mutation. The other changes are, for the most part, uh, benign. While I'm speaking of that, I just uh, want to give uh, a scenario. Let me give you a clinical scenario that's related to what I've just said. 40-year-old uh, 40, 40 woman comes in to see me as a patient. And she says, uh, Dr. Minch, I'm I really need to get genetic testing for breast cancer. Uh, my sister is 45 and she's just diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. And our mother uh, had ovarian cancer and died. And I'm really, really worried about breast cancer. And I wanna be tested. And as a matter of fact, I went to my OBGYN doctor and he tested me. But now, the reason I'm seeing you, that my test came back and there was good news and bad news. The good news is, uh, Ms. Smith, you don't have any mutation known to cause breast cancer. We did a panel 
of 20 genes, all known their mutations can possibly cause breast cancer. You don't have any of those. That's the good news. Some of you may have had this experience. But the bad news is uh, you've got three variants of unknown significance. We call those the VUS. You have three VUSs. And the patient says, what's that? says that to her doctor who ordered the test. And her doctor says, I don't know. <laughs> that really worries the patient. He ordered the test, came back, he doesn't know what it means. So go see Dr. Minch, he'll tell you what it means. <laughs> what I tell him is what I've just told you. Those variants of unknown significance are almost certainly benign differences which just account for how we, we differ from each other. Now occasionally, one of those variants turns out in a cancer family, it turns out it does have significance. So then we have to change. But it's interesting that most of the doctors ordering these tests uh, can't interpret the results. And this is, a, this is our new Sophistication in medicine is like our, it's like our new sophistication. It's like our sophistication in airplanes. Yeah. Sometimes it outstrips us. I mentioned sickle disease, and I just have to say that last week, big in the news, was that scientists cured a patient with sickle disease by taking out her hemoglobin gene, finding the bad letter, the wrong one, replacing it, putting it back in her bone marrow cells that make hemoglobin, growing them in tissue culture, until they had zillions of corrected blood-forming cells. Then they radiated her entire body to kill all the other bone marrow cells in her body so that, they, so that if they had left her at that point, she would die. It's a fatal dose of radiation. And then they put those cultured cells that they fixed back into her, and she's totally cured. Her blood has no sickle hemoglobin at all. This is the future of medicine. And that was with the HIV virus, wasn't it? And it was done with, a, with an HIV virus that was used to carry the gene, but the HIV virus was inactivated as an infectious agent. It was totally harmless. So she doesn't have HIV. She has normal hemoglobin now, not a single sickle cell. I forgot my, my great, great mentor, one of those Nobel laureates at Stanford, Paul Berg, now 93 years old, still working in the lab was, and we saw him last year, he's, he's just so vividly alive. He was the first person in history to take a gene from one animal, a rabbit. He took rabbit bone marrow, took out the gene for hemoglobin, and put it into E. coli, the common colon bacteria and grew up colonies of E. coli producing rabbit hemoglobin. So he was the first person in history to show, I can take DNA, I can cut it, chop it, transfer it, attach it to some other DNA in a different animal and create whatever you want to create. And that's what our whole, this is now what, what exists and will be the future of medicine. Paul got the Nobel Prize for that. 
And I have, before leaving genetics, I have to mention to you that all genetic diseases, and actually it's just the minority, are caused by single mutations. We call those Mendelian disorders, like sickle cell disease is a, is a model. Cystic fibrosis it would be a model for that. Uh, and so on and so on for 7,000 diseases. But um, a bigger chunk of genetic disorders are what are called polygenic multifactorial. And they depend on the coming together of groups of genes that when with the others in the group and with the right factors of the environment, such as being alcoholic or, or uh, eating too much or any, any of the environmental factors that can impinge on genes. But these multifactorial disorders are the great bulk of genetic disorders. Another way to, to think about this is that whatever is our health or disease, it's a combination of multiple genes and multiple environmental factors. I, I'll, I'll give uh, a simple example of this. Let's take alcoholism. If I had, uh, there are some genes that contribute to the tendency, the vulnerability to become alcoholic. So there is a genetic, genetic factors. But uh, if I never drank alcohol at all, I wouldn't be alcoholic. So it takes that combination of the genes and the environmental factor to produce the illness. So I can actually gonna Jeff is here, I'm gonna make it on time. Jeff. He's right. <coughs> oh Jeff is <laughs> Jeff is <laughs> Jeff is Jeff is <laughs> he's hiding. He's hiding behind a camera. <laughs> so we come to genomics and what many of you have been asking uh, time and time again, we've been asking you about 23andMe. So 23andMe and Ancestry.com uh, are available uh, means for learning something about your genetic status. So let me just review. Uh, each of us receives 23 chromosomes from our mother's egg and 23 chromosomes from our father's sperm. Now, if, if, the, if I took a basketball here and blew up a mother's egg to the size of a basketball so you could see, then the, the relative size of the, of the sperm would be like, like uh, my pen. Okay, so a basketball and a pen. And that basketball contains two X, uh, contains one X chromosome. And the sperm contains either an X or a Y chromosome. So the Y chromosome uh, determines male sex. So I have to tell you about your father of fathers and your mother of mothers. Men have a Y chromosome. It's the smallest chromosome. And it contains the information, uh, basically the information to make a testis out of a 
undifferentiated gonad. So a, a, an eight-week fetus has undifferentiated gonads. They, if you examine them under a microscope, you can't tell the difference between an ovary or a testis. But if, if that fetus has a Y chromosome, the undifferentiated donad, gonad becomes a testis. And then from that comes the hormonal changes and so on for the total development of maleness. The ovum contains only one of the two X chromosomes that all females have. So females are all XX, males are XY. The father of fathers goes like this. Every, every male has a Y chromosome. And you got your Y chromosome from your father. It couldn't come from your mother. She doesn't have one. And your father got it from his father. He got it from his father and his father and his father, going back forever into, into history. This has been looked at in an interesting way. For example, Aaron was the brother of Moses. And Jewish tradition is that uh, the, uh, the Jewish priests, the Cohens, have male succession in contrast to female succession, which is the basis of heredity in, uh, in every other way in the Jewish religion. So some, some Israeli scientists said, well, if uh, Aaron was the brother of Moses and he was the first of the Cohen priests, then any person with the name Cohen or a derivative of Cohen, like Kahani and all, all the variants of Cohen, those men should have a sequence in their Y chromosome identifying them. And to make a long story short, that turned out to be true. So for a couple of thousand years back, the Y chromosome can be traced back to Aaron, the brother of Moses, by, just by DNA sequencing. Um, Jewish men who are not named Cohen don't have that sequence. They have Y chromosomes, but they don't have the Cohen sequence. So it's the concept of at each generation back, you have a father of fathers. You may have 64 male relatives at a certain level back in your family tree, but of those 64 men, only one of them is your father of fathers because he's the one who's connected to you with no intervening female. Only male, 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 male uninterrupted by a female, and you get your Y chromosome from that man who's your father of fathers. Now, I haven't mentioned, um, and by the way, when, when my uh, DNA was studied, my father and father uh, lived 35,000 years ago in Europe, and they can determine based on the DNA sequence of my Y cross. Now, there's one other thing you need to know. Most of your DNA, almost all of it, is in the nucleus of your cells. But each of us has another minor genome in the mitochondria of our cells. And the mitochondria are the powerhouses that provide energy from our food transferred into the energy we need to be alive. We have thousands of mitochondria in every cell in us. 
Now here's the interesting thing. Remember my basketball and my pen? The, the basketball ovum has thousands of mitochondria. And all of our mitochondria come from our mothers. Because although a sperm has mitochondria, they are jettisoned in the neck and tail when the head of the sperm penetrates the egg. So only the head of the sperm gets into the egg. And in the head of the sperm is all the male DNA, but no mitochondria. So all of our mitochondria come from our mothers. So that means if we go back, we have one mother, we have two grandmothers, four great-grandmothers, eight great-great-grandmothers, and so on. But in each generation going back, only one of our female ancestors is the donor of our mitochondria. That's our mother of mothers. My mother of mothers lived 30,000 years ago. And uh, when you go back that far, amazing things happen. It turns out that, uh, and I, I can't go through this whole story, but it's been published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. St. Luke had the same mother of mothers. <laughs> so that means that St. Luke and I are distant, distant, distant cousins. <laughs> but when you go back 30,000 years, almost every person in Europe has that same mother of mothers. 30,000 years is a long, long time. So that brings us to 23andMe and the commercial genotyping that you can get by mail. information you get is interesting, it's valid, and it's useful, but it needs to be understood and interpreted. So that uh, it turns out to be good. For example, the, a worst outcome from doing your 23andMe or your Ancestry.com is the result comes back and you find out uh, your father is not your father. <laughs> and, uh, this is not rare. We laugh, but this is a this is a tragedy when it happens. This is a tragedy uh, to which I can attest uh, through patients who have discovered, uh, for example. Uh, in routine genetic testing, a man discovering that none of his children are his. Uh, and it's a, it's a heartbreak, heartbreaking thing. So that's that's a possible bad outcome. <laughs> Another one is that uh, there's a discovery of what was supposed to be an absolutely confidential a uh, sperm donor who becomes revealed by the commercial genetic testing is done and it turns out uh, that he becomes identified when he, he was promised never to be identified. Um, another thing that can happen is that, well, well, let me say there are two differences right off the bat between 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com tries to relate your DNA results to what is known about your family tree. And say, this person seems to be your fourth cousin and can make that connection. Ancestry.com, uh, last time I looked, was not telling you uh, what 
di uh, diseases you are at increased risk for. 23andMe will tell you uh, a list of diseases that you are more or less likely to acquire because of your genetic information. Um, both of them try to tell you the source of your ancestors. But in doing that, you have to be a little bit careful because our ancestors did move around and go from place to place. So for example, Iceland was founded by Norwegian Vikings who stopped in Ireland on the way and captured all the women and put them on their ships and killed all the Irish men and sailed on to Iceland and founded Iceland. So uh, if you're a descendant there aren't too many descendants from Iceland, but if you are one, you might be told by 23andMe that you're, that you're Irish or that you're Norwegian. And you might say, gee, I thought I was Icelandic. So there could be confusion between where your ancestors came from and where most of the people related to you are now. Because there, all of these laboratories that are doing this uh, commercially to try to tell you your origins are using different databases, population databases, so that any conflict in what they report, and they've been criticized in, in the news by people saying, well, I went to one lab and they told me one thing and another lab told me another thing. It's not that they're doing it wrong. It's that they're using a different database, population database. That can happen. Um, now, you can go to the grocery store, namely Albertsons, a gigantic chain of grocery stores nationwide. And uh, Albertsons has partnered with a company called Geno Mind. And they offer walking into the grocery store, you get a gene panel called GeneSept. And it's purported to optimize your treatment for anyone on a list of psychiatric disorders, <laughs> most notably of which would be chronic anxiety or depression. So let's say you have chronic anxiety that's borderline uh, or chronic depression that's borderline disabling. You go to Albertsons and you say, uh, my psychiatrist gave me this pill for my depression, but it doesn't seem to be working. I'm still depressed. And Albertsons grocery store says, okay, we have a gene panel for that. Uh, we can tell you what is the best antidepressant for you to take. Needless to say, this is highly controversial and <laughs> not terribly well backed up in science. So I, I would not recommend if, you, if you're chronically anxious or depressed or post-traumatic stress system. I do not recommend going to Albertson. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a host of these other these uh, couple companies. Explain about 23andMe how it comes because a lot of people, you know, they don't know how how is it tested. It's not blood; it's saliva. Well, the t yeah, these tests are done on saliva now because in your saliva uh, there are enough cells from the sides of your mouth, the, what's called the buccal mucosa. There, there are cells in your saliva, and those cells uh, contain DNA, and uh, uh, tiny, tiny amounts of DNA can be sequenced. So when you order, they send you a test to you, a little tube, and you spit into it and send it back. It's that simple. 
my wife did that. <laughs> and, and by the way, the results that she got back uh, were totally uh, uh, congruent with what she knows of her family history. Right? She did 23 and me. Because 23 and me gives you also the health risks and it tells you, you know, what genes and. Um, no, I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot something. Uh, health risks. You have to understand relative risk, the concept of relative risk. Uh, generally speaking, person after person after person in our culture and society is worried about having Alzheimer disease. That's a big thing on everybody's mind. So one of the things that 23andMe report and these and competing companies report is, are you at elevated risk for Alzheimer's disease? or are you at lower risk for Alzheimer's disease? The concept of relative risk, if the overall background risk is, let's say, 1%, and that would be in the order of magnitude, about 1% of us are, and I'm covering all age groups, and it's a big generalization, but 1% of us are destined to have Alzheimer's disease. Well, if your risk is double, and it goes up to 2%. It's still negligible risk, but when it's reported to you that your risk for Alzheimer's is double, it puts people in a panic. They think, they interpret that wrongly, meaning they're going to have Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean that. It just means they're more likely than average. But but the average is still a low risk, and double is still low. So you need to understand that when your results come back, not to pin. So finally, I just want, some of these other companies are called, the grocery store companies are called, one is Genesight Psychotropic. <laughs> Another one is called Right Med. Another one is called CNS Dose. Uh, I would avoid those. <laughs> Finally, I need to mention that uh, the new there's a new field called genetic genealogy to find criminals. <laughs> and you've all read about GEDmatch and uh, the uh, Golden State Killer being found because now more than 17 million persons have their DNA profiles in genealogical databases that are open to be used by law enforcement to find a genetic connection between a sample taken at a crime scene and find a rapist or a killer. And the Golden State Killer was the first one revealed just last week in a little town 15,000 people in Ozark, Alabama. They found uh, a rapist killer who was a classmate in school of the chief of police of Ozark, Alabama. And they, they found this killer uh, by looking at DNA databases. And uh, the way it works is they find that the DNA left at the crime scene uh, leads to uh, certain DNA sequences which are found in a, in a family 
and then by carefully investigating all the branches of the family, they find a person in the family that could have been the killer. And then they go to him and ask him, can we check your DNA? And if he says yes, uh, in this case in Ozark, Alabama, and in more than 40 cases done in the last year, uh, they have an exact match. And it's very difficult for an accused killer with an exact match of his DNA to say, oh no, I wasn't there, I didn't do that. <laughs> so that's the new science called genetic uh, genealogy. I'm reminded of having been the first expert witness in a rape murder in Florida. And I remember at the Fry hearing, the, the judge asking me, Dr. Minch, what is this thing called DNA? I don't know what, what is DNA? <laughs> that was about 30, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, but having to explain to the judge what I've been talking about. The killer then signed a 40-page confession detailing exactly what he had done. Finally, I, I just want to emphasize that evolution and Darwinian selection, natural selection, are absolutely fundamental to understanding and applying genetics and genomics. Now, as I walked in, I passed four peacocks. <laughs> We look at these beautiful animals with this beautiful plumage and this ridiculous little thing on their head, a little umbrella. <laughs> and you wonder, wait a minute, Darwinian selection. How, how were these animals selected to survive? And very interestingly, Biologists are now reconsidering another kind of selection that Charles Darwin originally proposed and, and abandoned. And it was a, Charles Darwin said, it looks as though some animals are selecting beauty for their reproduction. They're looking at a possible mate and saying, ooh, she's really pretty. <laughs> so, so, so this has become a very respectable new, new branch now of maybe Darwinian selection as we've understood it is not the only selection. That, and this sense of beauty has now been observed in some species of fish, amphibians, and birds. Beauty is difficult to define, but it abounds in nature. And it exists not only in structure, but in miraculous natural phenomena. I'm just going to quote, close with the monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies located in Mexico in a special preserve, a World Heritage Site, in March of every year, head out for southeastern Canada. And it takes them five generations of butterflies to get from Mexico to Canada. In other words, the whole flock of them, millions of them, die like when they get to Arizona. <laughs> but they lay eggs and a whole new generation arises 
and they go a little bit farther, maybe up to Arkansas, and they die, and then another generation gets up to uh, Indiana, and they die, and they finally, after five generations, they get to Canada where they spend the summer. <laughs> Here's the miracle. Their great, great, great grandchildren now of a single mind in the millions head out for Mexico. <laughs> and go back to exactly where their five generation ancestors started. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? Because you got it well. All the way. Milkweed, they eat milkweed all the way. Each time. Each time. So I, I just close with uh, a quote from Albert Einstein. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle.